Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I am happy to have you here with me today. We have some new babies born on the farm that I'm going to take you down to introduce you to. Miss Thistle over here is very close to calving. She still has not calved yet, so I think last time we checked on her together, I said I thought within 48 hours, and it's been 48 hours, so I was incorrect. Hi, honey. That is looking like a very, very full udder. Oh my goodness. So one of the big indicators that she is going to calve today is the fact that her actual teats are bulging and filled with milk. Um, before this point, I don't know if you remember, but her actual udder was starting to fill, but the teats themselves were not, and now they very much are. I think potentially today. Hi, Oreo. How's it going, little man? <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> He's such a silly boy. I'm not coming in there. Hi, honey. This is Oreo, and honey is his mama. I wonder if I can get through this hot wire without getting shocked. Ah, there we go. Um, I'm just gonna show you what I've done with my hives. I have done a couple of splits on my hives. This big hive right here, I'm standing right in their flight path. <laughs> this hive that's right here, you can see how active it is and all the bees that are out the front. So I did a split on this hive into this hive over there. And you can see all the bees flying in and out of that hive. So it's doing really well. I did that one just about four weeks ago. So it's almost time for me to check and make sure that they made a queen and that she is laying. And this one over here, you can actually see they've been cleaning out that hive. Um, all of that stuff that's in the front on the landing board there, that is all stuff that they've been cleaning out of the hive. And there's some activity happening in that hive. So I just did the split on this one about a week ago, so I won't be going in there to check on anything for at least three more weeks. This hive here was just so huge with so many bees in it that I um, was worried that it was going to swarm. So by doing these splits, hopefully I'm gonna end up with two extra hives as long as they can build out enough of a colony to make it through the winter. I have held a whole bunch of honey back um, to be able to load them up with honey if they don't have enough time to fill up one of those supers there. I like to leave them with at least a full super of honey, which is around 60 pounds or so of honey, um, in the winter to help them get through the winter. <laughs> Hi, buddy. How's it going? This little dude right here is Patty, born on St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to take you down to show you the new babies that just hatched out. And then Dan and I are going to go up and install our new solar system on our cabin. I cannot wait to show you that. I'm so excited about it. Uh, oh, look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six little ducklings have hatched out. And I can see we have a couple of males, one, two, three, four males and two females. So which what with Welsh Harlequins, the ones with the dark beak are the males and the ones with the light beak are the females. Look at them, aren't they so sweet? This is where she comes to hatch her babies every single year. She's five years old, such a good mama, and she always builds her nest right here. I wonder if she's gonna have any more babies. She just started hatching these guys out yesterday. So usually she'll sit on the nest for around 24 to 48 hours after the first one starts hatching, and then she will leave it and she will take them out onto the farm. We are going to be putting in the power to the cabin today and I am so excited about it. This is kind of the big step in getting the cabin complete. And for those of you that are new to our channel, this little cabin was built in the 1960s this little cute cabin here. And the people that built the main house over here lived in it for two years. And as well as in this old trailer up here, they just put it beside it. And they raised a couple of their kids in this house until they were able to move into the big house. So it's been sitting pretty much an empty shell for the last 40 years. We are putting some vinyl plank flooring in here. And I'm just gonna paint the walls a really nice light color just to keep it nice and bright in here. One of the things that I love about this cabin the most is the little porch 
and the gorgeous view. One of the things that we have found over the last couple of days of just enjoying sitting on this porch is there is a constant cool breeze blowing through here and this overhang really helps to keep this little cabin nice and cool, which is just an added bonus. The power system that we are going to be installing into this today is a solar system and it is made by Blue Eddy, and we are going to run through all the specs for it with you. And the bonus of this is because this little cabin does not have power, it's not hooked up to our main power source over here. And we are actually working on putting a solar system in for the main house as well. So to be able to start with this little cabin on solar is fantastic. I'm really excited about this. Me too. <laughs> See what they actually look like. I've been kind of looking at these boxes in my shop for months. It's <laughs> very exciting. I don't know if I'm speaking to people who know or not, but this is a, a plug and play solar system, which means there's no hard, hard wiring involved at all. Everything just plugs in like wall outlet style. And the reason our other solar system hasn't got put in yet is because you have to have an electrician in and there's a bunch of digging and burying cables and massive uh, mounts for solar panels. But this is electrical plugs. Oh, that's so cool. So this is actually portable. You can use it on your RV or you can use it in a cabin. You can move it from cabin to cabin. Um, when we talked to Blue Eddie about this, I requested this system because this system is actually the same size as in 5,000 watts of output and a 10,000 watt surge as the big system that we're putting in the house. So when I was doing some research, I did watch some people and you can actually run your entire house off this because this is an expandable system. So you can buy two inverters and then have 220 or 240 volts to run your um, large appliances and you can buy multiple batteries. This is the battery. Oh, it's so, it's cute. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's awesome. actually really nice looking. Yeah, no, I told you. Yeah, it doesn't look bad oh, at all. I'm stoked on this. So this is the battery. This is a lithium ion battery. Uh, it's their latest model. Their old models were a B300. This is a B300S. And the only difference as far as I understand is these ones have a built-in heater so that they um, perform better in cold temperatures. Which is important for us. Which it is, especially if you're gonna put it somewhere like a cabin or an RV where you might not be for weeks at a time. And then you have to be able to go in and, and turn it on and have it be able to perform right out of might be the minus 20 kind of thing. Mm. So I think that's all that's in there. You know, for a lot of solar system stuff, it feels like you have to have a degree almost or hire an expert. That's not the case here. This is simple, simple, simple. Everything is just plug and play, and if you don't have enough power, you can just buy more panels, plug them in, buy another battery, plug it in. Everything just builds on itself, and it's fantastic and, and, you're very and portable. <laughs> and I'm really excited about it. If we had had this system first, I never would have shopped for another system for the house. I would have doubled the size of this one, and it would have a higher capacity than the one that I bought <clears throat> for the house. So because this is a partnership, where they're sponsoring this video. We did ask them for a um, link that you guys can click on that could give you a benefit from going through through our video. So if you click on the link that Chelsea will provide, then you'll get 5% off if you guys are shopping for a system like this. There is a lot of detailed information available online for this exact system. The system comes in multiple sizes. I think it's a good idea, if whether you want to go solar or not, to have a backup system in your house. This system, some of the simple benefits of this are, you can have this in your house. You can buy the smaller version of this as well. There's just one that's just a completely compact. It's just one unit. Um, and you just leave it plugged into your wall and it's charged. And then if you have an outage, if there's a like a, a tree down or whatever, on your power line and you have an outage for 24 hours, it's charged and ready to go all the time. So you can plug in your freezer or your fridge and not have your food spoil and things like that. You can still plug in your internet router and be able to communicate with people if you need to or do your work. That's I just think so it's a great important. idea. Yeah. I mean, in this case here, like our goal is to go 
on grid, off grid, so we have the benefits of both. But this system, we're also talking, Chelsea and I are talking about building multiple cabins. So to have a portable system that you can just carry up to a cabin and plug it in at any time is ideal, it's perfect. One of the things that we've talked about doing is putting some cabins way up at the top of the mountain. We've taken you up there before. It has a stunning view of the valley up there. So to be able to have a system like this that we could bring up and have the cabin have power and then bring it back down when it's not in use is so convenient. So these are stackable. Everything just notches together. That's so cool. But they're they're well designed because you can also run just the battery alone if you need it. And you can actually just charge just the battery straight from the solar power panels. I'm looking forward to seeing the solar panels. Yeah, me too. It's kind of the one thing I haven't really seen online too much. If you have that sitting in your camper or or your cabin or mm -hmm. your house even. It looks good. Yeah, it does look nice. It doesn't look like a bunch of wires and <laughs> ugliness, you know? It's definitely it's, your style. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to try and make that other setup look good too. But... And that's how it sits. That's pretty fancy too. Yeah. So what's great about this is if you need more batteries, you just buy more and you plug them in. Just to add on. It's simple. So the great thing right now, these days, is that solar panels are actually solar powers super affordable way more so than for when panels, we first yeah. do you remember when we were first looking probably 15 years ago solar systems were so expensive i mean they're still not cheap but relatively speaking compared to what they were they're way more affordable now looking at reviews online this is always one of the top brands blue eddy for this type of system don't really expect to have a lot of problems some help mm. Oh, I don't. Well, oh, it's tearing. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like a portable system. Mm -hmm. That setup. Oh, but you can hang it. Look. Oh yeah, there's the. So you can just hang it right on the wall. Oh, perfect. So I guess we just have to decide if we're going to go straight up and down or across. But look, that's a lot of nice panels. So how many watts are these panels? So that's 420 watts in total. Okay. So I guess they're 105 each. So this little setup actually has 120 watts more than our first house had. That's crazy. Oh, easy peasy. Yeah. Solar array, <laughs> done. done. <laughs> I just hang it underneath the window for now and then once we side it, we'll put it up there. Yeah. Okay. That sounds like the easiest option. I think we should we'll probably end up buying a second one and we could put one below and one above. Okay. In the end, maybe. I guess especially if somebody was living in here full time, mm -hmm. wasn't just coming for a weekend. I love seeing dreams come to reality. <laughs> so number one, just having this cabin so close to actually being done. And now we're actually going to have power to it, which is great. We've been running extension cords out here to do all the work. And now we're actually going to have power here on its own, which is so exciting. Yeah. It really so, is just pick up, plug and play, hey? Eh? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Now, so now both, both batteries are now charging. And if we wanted to charge it off the house, we could charge it off the house too. Okay. And then if you want to just charge the batteries from the solar panels, you can do that directly. And uh, have 12 volts output. Okay, quick and simple. You guys just watched me. I'd never, I didn't even read the instructions, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to figure out how to plug these in. That's that easy. That's a huge plus. Like I said, for the other system that we're putting in the house right now, we have to have an electrician in, we have to have a backhoe, we have to have huge panel uh, array framework to hold all the solar panels and stuff it's it's a and then it's not portable at all you can never move it once it's there it's there mm -hmm. so this has got some definite advantages even though this is a 5000 watt output and it has a 10000 watt surge capacity uh, anytime an appliance starts, like a washing machine or something, or, oh, blah, blah, <laughs> washing machine or something, it takes a surge of power just to get it moving. And then once it's moving, then it's at its kind of rated power. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it has a 10,000 watt surge, 5,000 watts of output this inverter can do. 
This is very generic, but things like refrigerator, you know, they're like 750 to 1000 watts. So you can, you know, like those little plug-in electric heaters, they're 1500 watts typically. So that gives you kind of a, a rough idea for power consumption. Things like your internet and stuff and your LED lights, they take almost no power. Okay. So. And that's what we put in here was LEDs, LEDs, LEDs yeah. everything. Each battery is rated for 3072 watt hours. And I'll tell you in the future after we reviewed it, but from what I understand, sort of what that looks like is one battery would run like a refrigerator or a freezer for 24 hours. Okay. Without any charging input at all. Uh, there's six ways to charge this up again. Uh, solar power, obviously. You can plug into the wall outlet uh, through this cable, which just plugs in there and then you plug it into the wall and keep it charged at all times. So you have a backup for your home or you can plug into this cable and plug it actually into like your 12 foot outlet, mm -hmm. like a car charger. If you want to charge off your car alternator or something, you could plug in this into a car if you're camping or whatever. And then the other two things you can do, you can just transfer power from one battery to another. Like if you had a car battery or something, you can connect it up to this directly and just use it like that. Or you can also charge from a generator, obviously. That's awesome. Yeah, super, uh, really super well thought out cool. that way. This is just a temporary situation we have going on until uh, we have an electrician, my son, who's an electrician, come and put in our power panel. AC is is um, alternating current, so that's your house circuit. Okay. So we're going to turn it on. Oh, you heard it turn on. Yep. It's quiet. Oh, you have power. Look, look, look. Oh. <gasps> <laughs> That's so that. exciting. Oh All my gosh. Okay, that is the coolest thing. It's alive. Look at that. Wow. Good job, hon. <laughs> this looks fantastic. Wow. See outside I work? Let's see. <gasps> Yippee. No, it's working too. Yep, everything's working. Well, there we go. <laughs> so exciting. 100% solar cabin all of a sudden. That's amazing. I'd like to try some things on it. Well, first what? of all, let's, um, what can we try? You want to try, <laughs> we could try one of your saws. Like the big one? No, just this little one. How about this one? Oh, big one? <laughs> okay. Let's see what solar power can do. Shall we? Let's do it. You're excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm stoked. I just like that it's, anybody could use that. That's what I like. Yeah, I love that too. And it's like, you see how easy it is. We could just unplug it all and take it with us. Amazing. Like if we wanted to go um, over landing or something, mm -hmm. that could just go in a vehicle. You put the, the panels on the roof and away you go. Well, first of all. It doesn't even, it's just like it was plugged into the hydro. That is incredible. Yay! Woohoo! Pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. And it just looks so cute in here. I love it. I don't mind this. So my plan here is to put a countertop over this mm -hmm. and then put the little mini fridge beside it. It's completely quiet. You can't hear There's a thing. There's no sound. I am a sound sensitive person, so any like vibe or um, like buzzing or anything like that bothers me. So I was worried that this was going to make noise, but it doesn't at all. It's completely quiet. So even if we decided to keep it in here, it, it's not a problem. Nobody's going to be bothered by that, especially if there's a little pretty curtain in front of it. No. <laughs> Dan really likes the way that it, it looks. It looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, we have a link down in the show notes for you. If you want to purchase a Blue Eddy system like this or a smaller one, anything that you need. And there is a discount code for 5% off of your purchase. And I'll also put that in the first pinned comment. Thank you to Blue Eddy for partnering with us for this video. We really appreciate it. Okay, now that we're done that and we have power, we are going to head into the garden and grab some celery to add to our stock pot. So what I do with my um, chicken backs, I cut all the meat off and then I roast the chicken backs in the oven at 350 for a couple of hours. And the reason that I do this is because I much prefer the flavor of soup stock with roasted bones. So I roast them up 
and then I put them into my big stock pot and I'll show you when we get up to the house. I always call it my cauldron. So we're gonna bring about that much celery up with the tops to add to our stock. I already have a couple bulbs of garlic, um, three or four onions with the green tops thrown in there as well. Maybe we'll grab some herbs to add to it. We'll grab a little bit of sage. A little bit of oregano. Every year my stock tastes a little bit different because depending on what I have growing in the garden, that's what I use to flavor it. I don't put any salt or anything like that in. I just add salt to the stock when we actually use it. So we'll bring all this up and get to canning. I've already canned, I wanna say maybe 32 quarts of chicken breasts and thighs. And I'll share with you how I did that once we get up to the house. I have the canner full of the last batch of meat. And then we're gonna start running through all of our broth. I did make one big stock pot full of broth last night. Another one going right now in the stock pot. And then I'm gonna get some more backs roasting. We have 60 backs to do, so that is a lot of broth. But I just thought I saw my cat up in this tree, but I don't know if you can see it up there. It's actually just a crow. I have a black cat and I thought for sure that was him, but thankfully not. Okay, so we're just gonna wash off any of the dirt on our celery and then we'll go throw this right into our giant stock pot that I actually have set up outside. You'll see why when we go and check it out. So this is my big giant stock pot. So we're gonna throw all of our celery and our herbs. So I have my onions, my garlic, my celery, and all of that in here. And now we are going to go grab our backs and add those to the pot. So I have a big propane element here connected up to a propane tank. And we have this metal sign underneath here just so, because it does get really hot so it doesn't burn the deck. Our deck is one of those projects that we have on the to-do list because it needed to be replaced probably eight years ago when we bought the ranch and we haven't gotten around to it yet. So it's kind of a catch-all for all my junk. And eventually what I would love to do is put a glass railing on here so that you can sit here and overlook this beautiful view. But for now, I use it for making stock, smoking meat, barbecuing, all that kind of stuff. So we have my big trays here of backs. So we're gonna add 10 backs to our stock pot. And then we're going to fill these back up again and pop them back in the oven for another batch. Sweetie, would you be able to open the door for me, please? So we'll load these trays. I'm just gonna give these trays a quick wash and then we'll load them back up with 10 more backs for the next load. I like to do around 100 jars at least of chicken broth. And I also have all of our bones from our beef that we butchered that I also want to do the same thing with. I basically do exactly as I do for the chicken. Make sure that the bones are all roasted up. You can absolutely make stock without roasting your bones. I just love the color and the flavor of roasted bone stock. I have one more bag that's in the fridge and then the rest of them I put in the freezer because I don't want them to sit for more than a couple of days in the fridge. Um, just cause obviously I don't want them to go bad. And then I'll just get to these as I can. And into the oven these go for a couple hours until they're nice and brown. And I like to try to cook the stock down for around six hours or so. So I can usually run two batches through a day. All right, we're all wiped up now. And I wanted to show you what I did for the actual chicken itself. The one canned product that I think looks rather unappetizing is any kind of canned meat. Just doesn't look that good, but it really, really tastes good. We use the um, canned chicken primarily for making chicken melts, which is something that we love. It's one of the recipes in my cookbook. I think I've probably done a couple videos on it as well, but 
This is um, so, so delicious. So I did the chicken breasts, quite a few of them. I also did some thighs here. So these are deboned thighs and I'm going to be using these to make uh, butter chicken, which is one of my favorite uh, recipes. I just love butter chicken so, so much. And I thought this would be a really convenient way to do it. I did two years ago can legs and thighs with the bones in right into the jars and I called it ugly chicken. If you watched my pantry tour video, you probably remember me talking about the ugly chicken, which is finally used up, thank goodness. But the legs, I really did not like the leg meat canned. I found it super stringy. The thighs weren't as bad, but by deboning them first and then canning them, I think they're even gonna be better because then I can just cut them into little cubes when I want to use them. I have 32 jars of canned chicken and one more batch in the pressure canner, which I won't turn on until I have the camera turned off just because it is very noisy. I did take a little bit of footage when I was actually processing the chicken, so I'll show you that now. And this is me just parting out uh, chicken. Um, I don't think I actually videoed deboning the thigh, but it's the first time that I've ever done it. So you probably shouldn't use me as an example of how to debone a thigh correctly. Uh, but parting out chickens is something that I have done a ton of. We did freeze five of the best chickens to use as roasters, but we're actually not huge roast chicken people. So I prefer to have it parted out. I just find it so much easier to um, use the meat in lots of different recipes when it's parted out this way. It does take a lot more time and that's kind of unfortunate but it is worth it in the end. So what we're gonna do here is part out our chicken. So we're going to cut down both sides of the chicken like so. I'm gonna to have to stand up for this. And we're going to cut a little bit here, a little bit here, and then break. Very, very easy to do. And then we're going to cut along and it just comes off just like so. So we're gonna do that on both sides of our chicken. Okay, so now we have our breast here and we're gonna take our knife and go right down the middle. And you'll see the breast bone right here. And it's pretty easy just to go down the side of the breast bone. And then you can just take, take your time to get as much of the meat off the breast bone as you can. And there we go, we have our breast. So we're gonna do the same thing on the other side, like so. And then our wings, I just throw my wings in my soup stock. My neck and my back are going to go into, into our tray to go in the oven and I'll roast those at 350. So you can totally leave your leg and your thigh just like this, but I am going to be canning my thigh meat. So can you see that? Yes. So I just put a cut, and then you just break it apart and cut it in half. Have a nice leg there and a nice thigh here. I am going to debone this thigh. This is the first year that I have deboned my meat before putting it into the freezer or the canner. So I'm definitely not an expert at it at all by any stretch of the imagination. So if you wanna learn how to debone thigh meat, don't watch me for that. <laughs> Go watch a, a butcher for that. Some already deboned um, thigh meat canned so that I can throw that into a quick butter chicken recipe. So I am going to jar up our stock now. And when I do stock, I try to use my regular mouth jar. So I'll show you the difference between a wide mouth jar and a regular jar. So one of the things that I do love about regular jars is they do seem to seal much better over the long run than the wide mouth jars just because there's less surface space um, for it to be held down, suctioned down. But um, it is awkward to get things out of these kinds of jars, which is why I use them for doing my stock because you can just dump them out. Whoops, <laughs> that one had a bit of water in it. Um, the other thing is these are a little bit more of a pain to actually wash. You do need to use a scrubby because you can't fit your hand into it, which is the thing that I actually prefer about the wide mouth jars. So they both have their place in canning in my opinion. So I wanna get all of this uh, stock um, jarred up and I'm actually just gonna sit it in the fridge until it's ready to go in the canner. 
This is a method that I use when I'm doing large batches of things. I think this is a 921 all-American canner and it only fits seven quarts. Eventually, I would love to have one of the giant ones where you can fit at least 14 quarts at a time. That would be fantastic. But since I don't have that now, what I do is I jar everything up, I put it in the fridge, and then I just run it through as I need it. The only thing that you need to do if you're going to do it this way is make sure that you dump out your canner and fill it up with cold water when you go put your cold jars in because otherwise you could end up with breakage. So let's get all of these. We'll get our wide mouth out of here. My um, chicken stock is very flavorful. It is so delicious because it has all of those herbs in it. One of the things that some people will do is to put their chicken stock in the fridge overnight and then skim off the fat off the top. And the reason for that is because when you're canning, sometimes the um, product on the inside will kind of bubble out over the side. And if there's a lot of fat in it, then the fat can affect your seal. I did leave this overnight and already skimmed off some of it. Sometimes I do that and sometimes I don't, especially when I'm just doing one batch after the other, like I'm doing right now. So definitely make sure if you are canning anything like broth or meat that you keep the edge, the top part of your jar super clean. Wash it with some hot um, water with vinegar in it because with the fat it can affect the seal. And then I go usually within about three quarters of an inch from the top and broth will can at our elevation at 15 pounds of pressure for 25 minutes for quarts. You can mix what you're canning. So say I had a couple of extra jars of canned meat. I could put them in the canner with this broth, but I would have to do it according to the longest processing time that was required for safe canning. So in the case of doing the meat itself, it's actually 90 minutes. So I would need to set my timer for 90 minutes rather than the 25 minutes for the broth. So technically this is a soup stock. It is not a bone broth because there are other ingredients in here outside of just the um, bones. And this is generally how I do it, especially when I'm canning things during the summer where I have all kinds of things coming up in the garden that I can throw in for extra flavor and extra nutrition. Okay, we are on to our second batch of bone broth in the canner and our, um, or not bone broth, <laughs> rather soup stock. And our soup stock down here has reduced quite a bit. So I'm gonna let it go for another two hours before we pull that off and start canning that. And our bones in the oven are just about roasted up. Ooh, lots of moisture in there. Oh, I wanted to show you something else that we did too. I did freeze dry a whole bunch of raspberries. Aren't those gorgeous? The color of them. So uh, my kids had these with granola and yogurt today for breakfast and they thought they were absolutely delicious. I find them a little bit sour and they taste seedier than they do when they're fresh because the seeds are soft um, when they're fresh, but they're still really, really good. So I'm definitely gonna freeze dry a bunch more of these and that's actually what we're gonna head out and do right now. Wow, that looks amazing. Look at all those raspberries. Nice work. So apparently Tiny, who is our duck, has come out of her nest with her babies, which means that she is done hatching them. So we'll see how many she actually ended up with. Little tiny bright yellow ducklings are the sweetest things ever. So I will make sure that I give you an update on how much chicken broth we ended up with when we are finished all of the canning. I have 42 jars of canned chicken, which I'm really happy about. I still have probably five or six left over from last year too. It's okay, I won't touch them, don't worry. So six little babies. Nice job. So I'm just gonna go check the nest and see what's left in there. So those are definitely rotten eggs that are left in there. So tiny, it's okay, honey. I'm not gonna touch your babies. This is actually one of my son's ducks and his plan is to sell the babies. This is a fairly small number of ducklings. She normally hatches out between 12 and 15 ducklings. So my son said he's gonna set up a pen for her so that he doesn't risk losing ducklings. Cause of course, when they free range around, we usually end up losing a few of them. 
So he's gonna get her all set up. I wanted to show you one more thing before we end today's video because I couldn't help but laugh when I saw this. This morning, my garden is starting to look a little bit thirsty. I think it's time to turn the sprinkler on out here. I don't want to water my garlic because my garlic is just about ready to harvest. Oh, actually, no, probably another couple days. So has anyone seen this before? This is a uh, scape that I missed. And down here in the stem, there is some garlic cloves coming out of the stem. I have not seen that before. But yeah, these are just about ready, usually three or four leaves totally dead before harvesting is what I like to see. So I was um, thinking of not putting the sprinkler over there and harvesting the garlic, but I think they can go for another week. So I'll put it on over there, but I also will water up on this part of the garden. This is so funny. So normally when I come into the high tunnel, I come in through the front doors and I make my way down this center aisle of the high tunnel, which I love. And <laughs> the tomato plants are just crazy, just beautiful. So anyway, I come down here and I'll turn on the water, check the filters, and then I'll come around this way. And I'll walk back out of the high tunnel this way. So it's been probably a week since I wandered around the entire high tunnel. So this morning I came down the path as I usually do. And I thought, you know what? I'll just check around this way. <laughs> do you see a pathway? I don't see a pathway. Um, yeah, so in order to even harvest all the tomatoes that I'm sure are going to be hiding in here in the next couple of weeks, I have no choice but to come in and trellis up these tomatoes. You really can't even see the path at all. And it's even worse from the other side. Well, I suppose worse is a matter of opinion because it does look beautiful. It is very jungle-like. It doesn't look nearly as kept as this aisle does. It is beautiful nonetheless. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my goodness. This is by far the most jungle like my high tunnel has ever been. And you know what? I'm okay with it. It just is what it is this year. And it certainly looks gorgeous. Look at all of these sunflowers. So all these sunflowers are volunteer sunflowers in my high tunnel and they just look gorgeous. And some of them are literally 10 feet tall and it's beautiful. One thing I am going to do though is turn on the drip irrigation because it is warm and should also open up the back door here because we are supposed to get another heat wave in the next week. Temperatures have been very cool, which has been a nice reprieve from all the heat, but it's supposed to heat up again. Whoa, you scared me. Oh my Did gosh. You see them? Yes, they're, they're so cute. cute. Oh, they're adorable. So we are going to go up and finish picking up the, or picking the rest of the raspberries in the raspberry patch. We only have probably a couple days left of harvesting from there before the raspberry season is over for us. And I'm probably gonna spend a few hours getting all of the tomatoes over in this aisle tied up, maybe not all of them. I'll get started on it anyway. I was just about to sign off from today's video and I was walking through the high tunnel, just kind of checking everything out and looking down low along the base of the tomato plants and look what I found. Look at this gorgeous tomato. So this is a bull's, I think it's called a bull's blood or bull's heart tomato. And even though it doesn't look like it's totally ripe, it actually is edible at this point. It's quite soft already. I'm so excited. <sighs> and on that exciting note, I'm gonna take my prize up to the house and slice it up and eat it on a piece of toast with mayonnaise and salt and pepper. And I can hardly wait. I hope that you enjoyed today's video, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.